Chapter 8 of The Adventures of Ferdinand Count Fathom by Tobias Smollett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Be this as it will, our lovers, though real voluptuaries, amidst the first transports of their enjoyment, did not neglect the great political aim of their conjunction. Teresa's bedchamber, to which our hero constantly repaired at midnight, was the scene of their deliberations, and there it was determined that the damsel, in order to avoid suspicion, should feign herself irritated at the indifference of Ferdinand, her passion for whom was by this time no secret in the family, and that, with a view to countenance this affectation, he should upon all occasions treat her with an air of loftiness and disdain. So screened from all imputation of fraud, she was furnished by him with artful instructions how to sound the inclinations of her young mistress, how to recommend his person and qualifications by the sure methods of contradiction, comparisons, revilings, and reproach, how to watch the paroxysms of her disposition, inflame her passions, and improve, for his advantage, those moments of frailty from which no woman is exempted. In short, this consummate politician taught his agent to poison the young lady's mind with her insidious conversation, tending to inspire her with the love of guilty pleasure, to debauch her sentiments, and confound her ideas of dignity and virtue. After all, the task is not so difficult to lead the unpractised heart astray, by dint of those opportunities her seducer possessed. The seeds of insinuation, seasonably sown upon the warm luxuriant soil of youth, could hardly fail of shooting up into such intemperate desires as he wanted to produce, especially when cultured and cherished in her unguarded hours, by that stimulating discourse which familiarity admits, and the looser passions engrafted in every breast are apt to relish and excuse. Fathom had previously reconnoitred the ground, and discovered some marks of inflammability in Mademoiselle's constitution. Her beauty was not such as to engage her in those gaieties of amusement which could flatter her vanity and dissipate her ideas. And she was of an age when the little loves and young desires take possession of the fancy. He therefore concluded that she had the more leisure to indulge these enticing images of pleasure that youth never fails to create, particularly in those who, like her, were addicted to solitude and study. Teresa, full fraught with the wily injunctions of her confederate, took the field, and opened the campaign with such remarkable sourness in her aspect when Ferdinand appeared, that her young lady could not help taking notice of her affected chagrin, and asked the reason of such apparent alteration in her way of thinking. Prepared for this question, the other replied in a manner calculated for giving Mademoiselle to understand that, whatever impressions Ferdinand might have formerly made on her heart, they were now altogether effaced by the pride and insolence with which he had received her advances, and that her breast now glowed with all the revenge of a slighted lover. To evince the sincerity of this declaration, she bitterly inveighed against him, and even affected to depreciate those talents in which she knew his chief merit to consist, hoping by these means to interest Mademoiselle's candor in his defense. So far the train succeeded. That young lady's love for truth was offended at the calumnies that were vented against Ferdinand in his absence. She chid her woman for the rancor of her remarks, and undertook to refute the articles of his dispraise. Teresa supported her own assertions with great obstinacy, and a dispute ensued, in which her mistress was heated into some extravagant commendations of our adventurer. His supposed enemy did not fail to make a report of her success and to magnify every advantage they had gained, believing in good earnest that her lady's warmth was the effect of a real passion for the fortunate Mr. Fathom. But he himself viewed the adventure in a different light, and rightly imputed the violence of Mademoiselle's behavior to the contradiction she had sustained from her maid, or to the fire of her natural generosity glowing in behalf of innocence traduced. Nevertheless, he was perfectly well pleased with the nature of the contest, because in the course of such debates he foresaw that he should become habitually her hero, and that, in time, she would actually believe those exaggerations of his merit, which she herself had feigned for the honor of her own arguments. This presage, founded upon that principle of self-respect, without which no individual exists, 
may certainly be justified by manifold occurrences in life. We ourselves have known a very pregnant example, which we shall relate for the emolument of the reader. A certain needy author, having found means to present a manuscript to one of those sons of fortune who are dignified with the appellation of patrons, instead of reaping that applause and advantage with which he had regaled his fancy, had the mortification to find his performance treated with infinite irreverence and contempt, and, in high dudgeon and disappointment, appealed to the judgment of another critic, who, he knew, had no veneration for the first. This common consolation, to which all baffled authors have recourse, was productive of very happy consequences to our bard, for, though the opinions of both judges concerning the piece were altogether the same, the latter, either out of compassion for the appellant, or desire of rendering his rival ridiculous in the eye of taste, undertook to repair the misfortune, and in this manner executed the plan. In a meeting of literati, to which both these wits belonged, he who had espoused the poet's cause, having previously desired another member to bring his composition on the carpet, no sooner heard it mentioned than he began to censure it with flagrant remarks of scorn, and, with an ironical air, looking at its first condemner, observed that he must be furiously infected with the rage of patronizing, who could take such a deplorable performance into his protection. The sarcasm took effect. The person against whom it was leveled, taking umbrage at his presumption, assumed an aspect of disdain, and replied with great animosity that nothing was more easily supported than the character of a Zoilus, because no production was altogether free from blemishes, and any man might pronounce against any piece by the lump, without interesting his own discernment. But to perceive the beauties of a work, it was requisite to have learning, judgment, and taste, and therefore he did not wonder that the gentleman had overlooked a great many in the composition which he so contemptuously decried. A rejoinder succeeded this reply, and produced a long train of altercation, in which the gentleman, who had formerly treated the book with such disrespect, now professed himself its passionate admirer, and held forth in praise of it with great warmth and elocution. Not contented with having exhibited this instance of regard, he next morning sent a message to the owner, importing that he had but superficially glanced over the manuscript, and desiring the favour of perusing it a second time. Being indulged in this request, he recommended it in terms of rapture to all his friends and dependents, and, by dint of unwearied solicitation, procured a very ample subscription for the author. But, to resume the thread of our story, Teresa's practices were not confined to simple defamation. Her reproaches were contrived so as to imply some intelligence in favour of the person she reviled. In exemplifying his pertness and arrogance, she repeated his witty repartee. On pretense of blaming his ferocity, she recounted proofs of his spirit and prowess. And in explaining the source of his vanity, gave her mistress to understand that a certain young lady of fashion was said to be enamoured of his person. Nor did this well-instructed understrapper omit those other parts of her cue which the principal judged necessary for the furtherance of his scheme. Her conversation became less guarded and took a freer turn than usual. She seized all opportunities of introducing little amorous stories, the greatest part of which were invented for the purposes of warming her passions and lowering the price of chastity in her esteem. For she represented all the young ladies' contemporaries in point of age and situation, as so many sensualists who, without scruple, indulged themselves in the stolen pleasures of youth. Meanwhile, Ferdinand seconded these endeavours with his whole industry and address. He redoubled, if possible, his deference and respect, wetting his assiduity to the keenest edge of attention, and, in short, regulated his dress, conversation, and deportment according to the fancy, turn, and prevailing humour of his young mistress. He, moreover, attempted to profit by her curiosity, which he knew to be truly feminine and having culled from the library of his patron certain dangerous books, calculated to debauch the minds of young people, left them occasionally upon the table in his apartment, after having directed Teresa to pick them up, as if by accidents, in his absence, and carry them off for the entertainment of Mademoiselle. 
Nay, this crafty projector found means to furnish his associate with some mischievous preparations, which were mingled in her chocolate, tea, or coffee, as provocations to warm her constitution. Yet all these machinations, ingenious as they were, failed not only in fulfilling their aim, but even in shaking the foundations of her virtue or pride, which stood their assaults unmoved, like a strong tower built upon a rock, impregnable to all the tempestuous blasts of heaven. Not but that the conspirators were more than once mistaken in the effects of their artifices, and disposed to applaud themselves on the progress they had made. When at any time she expressed a desire to examine those performances which were laid before her as snares to entrap her chastity, they attributed that, which was no other than curiosity, to a looseness of sentiment. And when she discovered no aversion to hear those anecdotes concerning the frailty of her neighbors, they imputed to abatement of chastity that satisfaction which was the result of self-congratulation on her own superior virtue. So far did the treacherous accomplice of Fathom presume upon these misconstructions, that she at length divested her tongue of all restraint, and behaved in such a manner that the young lady, confounded and incensed at her indecency and impudence, rebuked her with great severity, and commanded her to reform her discourse, on pain of being dismissed with disgrace from her service. End of chapter 8